uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Max Capuccio. I'm very happy to welcome you to the third seminar in our research series, which is dedicated to uh, autonomous cars and the challenges represented by the uh, and the challenges related to the development and the deployment of uh, personal autonomous vehicles. Um, I'm very happy this time uh, our speaker is uh, uh, Rahila David, uh, who is uh, uh, executive director of the Center for Autonomous and uh, uh, Connected Vehicles. Um, before we start, I would like to show our respect to the Gurnawal peoples that we acknowledge as the traditional guardians of the land on which this campus is located. And uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, my colleague uh, uh, Milad to come and uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Ms. Rahila David, uh, because he very much helped in the organization of the, this event. And uh, uh, he's a, a senior lecturer in uh, um, transport transport planning at the School of uh, Engineering and IT. Uh, please, Milad, thanks. Thank you very much, Max. Um, thank you, Max. Um, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the Laura Seminar Series. Today, we are privileged um, to have Rahila David with us. Rahila is the Executive Director of the Center for Connected and Automated Transport, CCAT. Um, CCAT is a government industry and community collaboration focused on facilitating the transition to a connected and automated transport future in Australia and New Zealand. Prior to joining CCAT, Rahila led the development of the safety assurance regulatory framework for the commercial deployment of automated vehicles in Australia at the National Transport Commission. Rahila has had a diverse policy career in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, leading regulatory reforms in areas including transport, energy, and local government. She has a wealth of knowledge about the pol uh, public policy environment, having worked for a government department, regulator, commission, and minister's office, and having specialized in government agenda setting in her postgrad studies. Um, today, um, she's going to talk about how ready we are for automated vehicles. Uh, I can't wait any longer to hear this presentation. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Rahila. Please join me in welcoming Rahila to the stage. Not a problem. All right, thank you very much, Milad and Max, and thank you for having me here in Canberra. Um, it's really great pre uh, pleasure to be here. It's been a little while, I said, since I've been on a university campus, so um, it's really, really nice to be here and, and see some some of your faces, uh, all obviously studying this area. Um, it's something that I've worked in for the last five years, and I'm going to share with you my take on how ready we are for automated vehicles. Um, so I understand that this series is about uh, why AVs aren't quite here yet and the reasons behind that and what we need to do to make that innovation real. Um, you've heard a little bit, I think, in previous sessions about the technology, um, about public acceptance. This session is going to focus on some of those more public policy aspects, which is my expertise. Um, so we're thought, talking about the things that are outside of the technology that also need to be ready to, um, to encourage the deployment of automated vehicles. I'd just like to point out as well that these are my own views. Um, they're not necessarily the views of the organization I work for, which is the Center for Connection and Automated Transport, nor the, the previous organizations I've worked for. So, I think we all know that there was definitely a lot of hype around automated vehicles about five, 10 years ago. But as that hype has died down, um, so have the timeframes for deployment coming from the manufacturers. Um, and I guess the main factor in the deployment of AVs is the technology itself, of course. 
Um, you know, it has to be safe and reliable enough to be ready to be commercially available uh, to consumers. And aspects of that, as I said, have been parts of the other presentations in the series. So I won't be talking about the technology barriers. I'll be covering those other things that do need to be in place as well. And you've got some of those up on the screen now. So of course the technology is first, uh, but then also there's the regulation, which is a really big piece that I've been involved in. Um, insurance needs to be ready. Uh, the broader, there are some broader policy challenges. Uh, trials are a really interesting space as well. Uh, the infrastructure should be there. And of course, public acceptance of the technology is really important to make sure that there is actually that uptake. And then I'll just cover some other practical challenges as well. I think that's right. Oh, it's a different screen. Maybe if you stop the share and start it again. Can you bring this in here? Does that work? Oh. Well, how about you go to the presentation hall on the PowerPoint and then try to share your screen? You should just share what you just oh, yeah, yeah. That's also required. This one? That's that. Yes. Sorry about that. That's that. That's that. Can I control that from here? I don't think I can control, control the slides. Check the slides back and forth. Not working. Oh. oh, I can go forwards. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's good. Thank you for pointing that out. It might have been a very confusing presentation otherwise. Um, so once we've got all of these things in place, uh, we will get to that end state of commercially deployed automated vehicles. Okay. So if you can keep track of the slides for me, that would be... <laughs> Great, just in case something goes on. All right, so what exactly are automated vehicles? So I guess um, the simple answer is that an automated vehicle is a vehicle that has an automated driving system in it. So what's an automated driving system? So an ADS is the hardware and the software that are collectively capable of performing the entire dry dynamic driving task um, on a sustained basis without human input. And you can see a picture there, that's the um, Honda Legend that has got some level three functionality. And it's got a range of sensors. You can see uh, the locations there of radar and uh, LIDAR uh, and, and the cameras. There we go. So you, I think you might have been through this uh, before, but these are the levels of automation. Um, this is kind of the accepted classification from SAE International. Uh, there's essentially there's six levels of automation if you count level zero, which is zero automation. Um, but levels one and two automation, they are essentially advanced driver assistance systems. Um, so they aren't vehicles that have an automated driving system in them, but they have these assistance systems. They can cover things like cruise control, um, lane departure warnings, those sorts of things. But I guess automated vehicles, those are the bits in green there, levels three to five. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about preparing for these things. Um, when we talk about the regulation, it's the regulation of level three to five vehicles. So these are the vehicles that have an ADS in them. So 
just briefly, the level three automated vehicle, that is, that is a vehicle with conditional automation. Um, that's where the automated driving system undertakes the entire dynamic driving task for sustained periods in quite defined circumstances. Um, so the human driver doesn't have to monitor the driving environment, but it does need to be receptive to uh, requests to intervene from the driving system. And that Honda vehicle on the right, which is covered up by my face there, um, that is the Honda Legend. It's got the Sensing Elite technology, which has a um, level three element to it, which is about, um, I think it's Traffic Jam Pilot. Uh, and I, going on to level four vehicles. Um, so level four is high automation. The automated driving system in those vehicles undertakes the entire dynamic driving task. Um, in some locations, uh, in some situations, or um, all of the time in defined places. So I guess in level four, um, there's two aspects. So there's a 4A, 4A type vehicle and a 4B type vehicle. Um, in a 4A vehicle, um, essentially the, the vehicle uh, can be driven both manually and uh, by a automated driving system. And a 4B vehicle, essentially the vehicle um, could be a dedicated AV, so it might not have a steering control, so it can operate it in, operate in all areas within its operational design domain, but that domain might be quite limited. And that easy mile shuttle there is an example of a level 4B vehicle. And then level 5, that is full automation, so all aspects of the driving task are undertaken by the ADS, and the ADS can operate in all kinds of driving environments, so it can cover the whole uh, network and there's no human driver required. All right. So I've picked out a few aspects just to talk about current deployment in Australia. So what is the landscape right now? All right, so in terms of the actual deployment of the technology, there aren't any automated vehicles that are currently commercially deployed. So by that, I mean available for general sale and supply. There are plenty of advanced driver assistance systems, um, you know, things like cruise control, they're, they're available now in, in the vehicles that we see on our roads. There's also plenty of automated vehicle trials. Um, there are, in fact, over 35 trials of automated vehicles that have been in, that have taken place in Australia, taken place in every state and territory, um, but they've had quite limited complexity. So, I'm not sure what that's about. Should I do anything there? Should I start that? <laughs> okay, talking. Um, so, for example, the the shuttle bus picture that I showed you before, that's an example of um, the type of trial that has been really the majority type of trial in Australia. These small shuttle buses that operated in, operate in quite limited domains, they operate at very low speeds. You often see them around university campuses and, and uh, foreshores, that kind of thing. So they're quite limited. Um, but there are also some more complex trials increasing. Um, there's a lot of trials or a couple of trials um, in integrated mobility environments. Um, so I'm thinking about uh, the QUT trial in Queensland, for example, in the, um, the CABI, the CHAD project um, in the AIMS environment in uh, Victoria. There's also been a range of partners that have been involved in trialing. So lots of different companies getting involved. The technology companies have been coming in from overseas mainly. Uh, we've got councils getting involved. Uh, governments have been putting in funding, there's been insurers involved, motoring clubs, so there's been a nice mix of, of parties trying to get involved in these trials. Um, there aren't any commercial applications, so for example in the US with Waymo we've seen these kind of robo taxi ride hail scenarios available, we haven't seen that kind of thing in Australia yet. Um, and trials are currently regulated at the state and territory level. So road transport is a state and territory government responsibility. So the trials are essentially taking place in individual states and territories. We haven't seen any cross-border trials yet. And then the last point there is that, um, you know, the technology is largely being imported for trials, um, but we are seeing that there is some development here in Australia. Uh, and I guess we'll increasingly see that um, as these trials go on. 
pipeline. All right, so this is the current status of regulation as well for trials. So currently you have to get a vehicle that's supplied to the market under what we call concessional approvals. So usually you have a approval of a type of vehicle and then you can just you know, send through as many vehicles of that type into the market. Here you're sort of approving vehicles on a vehicle by vehicle basis for, for certain purposes like tests only. Um, we have trials frameworks, so we have a set of national guidelines for, um, for trialers to see how they might apply for a permit or a, a ban or an, uh, for a sort of exemption from road rules to be able to trial on state and territory roads. And in terms of control and liability, it's the human driver that's always in control. So even if the automated driving system is engaged, it's the human driver that would be liable if something went wrong. So this is just to show you that um, there are a lot of people preparing for automated vehicles. You know, there's um, obviously we've got the ADS manufacturers up the front there. So they're the technology providers. We've got the re researchers here in this room, but there's all of these other people that are also preparing. We've got governments, um, we've got all the different agencies within governments. We've got government associated bodies like Austroads and the National Transport Commission, which is where I used to work. Um, we've got the infrastructure providers, we've got think tanks that are, you know, putting out information about this technology. You've got the consultancies working with governments on these projects. Um, so there's a huge array of people getting involved in this space, and that will increasingly be the case. I'm sure there are many more than, than those listed on this, on this slide. So I guess, why is everyone preparing? Why are all of these people working towards this? So, you know, the main thing is that there are a few benefits that we really see, um, we hope to see with these kinds of vehicles and that are expected. I guess the big one is safety. Um, I think this figure that's always bandied around, around 94% of crashes are um, contributed to by human error. That's a figure that came out of the US a little while ago. Um, so when you're taking away the human from uh, the driving tasks, so you're taking away fatigue, um, you're taking away speeding, poor decision making, distraction, all of those kinds of things, or at least reducing that, then obviously the safety benefits could be expected to be quite high. You've also got productivity as a potential benefit, I guess the way people value their time spent in a vehicle, if they no longer have to drive, they could be doing other things. Accessibility, so you know, having these vehicles, um, you know, be used for private use by people that might not have been able to um, use vehicles on their own before, of course, that will need to be supported by the right settings. Uh, mobility, these potentially open up new mobility options, and then those environmental and congestion issues as well. Again, these are most likely to be electric vehicles. Um, you might be able to have more efficient trips because of, you know, closer following times, that kind of thing. But I guess you also need the right policy settings because, you know, say, for example, you have these vehicles on the road and you don't want to park the car. So you send it off home while it's dropped you off and then you have suddenly have more car trips happening. So you need the right settings around um, some of these elements to make sure you get those benefits. I guess the other point to make is that potentially they're just coming anyway. So, you know, we all need to get involved because, you know, these things might just be coming anyway. The technology is already being developed. Everyone's got a little bit of momentum and, and they could be on our doorstep. So we need to prepare. And I think that's what all of those parties have, um, have recognized. So I'll start now taking you through these elements beyond the technology um, that do need to be ready for deployment. Um, this section will focus on regulation, uh, and I'll probably spend the most time here because it's the, the, the uh, factor that I'm most comfortable with. It's been my area of expertise for the last few years. Um, and I'm he talking here about the regulation that sort of enables the technology to be on our roads. So that basic 
regulation to make sure that these are legal and safe. So what's the current problem in the regulation? So essentially, currently, they just can't be operated legally on our roads outside of a trial setting. So driving here in the law is related to the human. It doesn't envisage a driver that isn't a human. Um, that's different uh, to New Zealand, actually. Uh, in New Zealand, the laws don't necessarily state that a driver has to be a human. So they have the kind of opposite issue where if a fleet of AVs were to be deployed today, it might just be legal, but they haven't sort of done that safety assurance yet. Here, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be allowed. Uh, so we also have um, international standards that are uh, being developed. Uh, that happens at the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Europe, the UNECE. They have working parties that develop vehicle standards. Those standards are agreed by many, many nations. And then uh, once they're agreed there, they're incorporated into um, design rules or vehicle standards. Here we call them the Australian design rules but that is a very slow process. So I think we've just seen the first level three ADS um, standard, or not even come in, been agreed at UNECE and um, has been consulted on here. And that's gonna be a very slow process to get all of these ADS elements um, into vehicle standards internationally and then incorporated here. So there's a need to sort of, I guess, get out in front of the technology because we can anticipate that the technology is going to be ready potentially before all of these vehicle standards are ready. So what is the current regulatory framework for commercial deployments? So currently we have two key regulatory stages. We call them first supply and in service. Uh, so at first supply, Vehicle manufacturers ensure that vehicles being supplied to the market for the first time meet those vehicle standards that I was talking about. Um, the RVSA is the Road Vehicle Standards Act, and that uh, enables the, the Australian design rules. And as I said, those rules are harmonized with those UNECE standards, and, and that standards development could be slow. In-service safety, there we're talking about in-services on the road. Um, so that's that second stage in a, in a vehicle's life. Um, vehicle roadworthiness here, that's the responsibility of the registered owner. Uh, so they have to maintain road, roadworthiness over its life. Uh, and on-road operation of the vehicle, that's the responsibility of the driver. The driver has to be licensed and they have to comply with the road rules. So that's the current framework. And you can see on the slide here, um, the actual regulatory framework. So you'll see that vehicles and driving are regulated very separately. So on the left, you've got how you make the vehicle safe. How do you assure its safety? On the right, you've got how do you assure that the driving is safe? So at first supply for the safe vehicle, that's what I was talking about with those Australian design rules. It's the manufacturer that's the regulated party at that point, And it's the Commonwealth government that's the regulator. When the vehicle's on the road, the safety of that vehicle is assured by uh, the registered owner. Essentially, they have to do the roadworthiness compliance. That's regulated at the state and territory level. So that's important to remember. Road transport, on-road transport, is regulated by states and territories. Driving, on the other hand, uh, that is, uh, that's also regulated by states and territories, both aspects there. But that is focused on the human driver. That's the regulated party. They have to be licensed before they get on the road. And then while they're on the road, they have to meet state and territory road rules. But what happens when you have an automated vehicle is that it really disrupts this framework where you're separating out the vehicle from the driving. So AVs, they have to have a safe design, but they also must undertake safe driving themselves. So they essentially become, it is the driver. Um, also, AVs can be modified remotely, so maintaining safety over the life of the vehicle also becomes important, not just for the human driver, but probably for the company that's made that automated driving system. So you have to start thinking about assuring the safety of the vehicle over the entire life cycle, rather than handing across safety assurance to the human parties. And I guess the other aspect to remember is that 
this could be an opportunity to create a nationally consistent framework. So, you know, we have on-road transport uh, regulated at the state and territory level. And, you know, these are going to be vehicles that are managed by companies that are, you know, big companies. They have fleets operating nationally. Not sure if that is conducive maybe to, to state and territory uh, regulation necessarily. So it's important to remember that, that though there are many expected benefits from automated vehicles in particular um, around safety, they won't eliminate all existing risks and they might actually introduce new risks around cybersecurity and you know, vehicles malfunctionings, that sort of thing. So there is a need for regulation to still um, manage these vehicles and this might be an opportunity to manage that regulation in a different way. So the good news is that work is underway to shape the regulation for the commercial deployment of automated vehicles. So infrastructure and transport ministers gave a direction to the National Transport Commission about five years ago to develop a regulatory framework for automated vehicles. Uh, and since that time, they've agreed to various aspects of that framework, which the NTC has recommended in conjunction with uh, the Commonwealth and state and territory governments and close industry consultation. So we've got the first supply framework there on the left and the in-service framework there on the right. Um, the first supply framework has been uh, agreed by ministers uh, that was agreed in 2018. Um, essentially, a new regulated party has been developed, the Automated Driving System Entity. So if you recall on the previous slide where we talked about the regulation um, at first supply for a vehicle that falls on a manufacturer, here we're talking about this new regulatory concept in ADSE. That can, that can be the manufacturer, but it could be any other party. So essentially, that's a party that self-selects and says, okay, I'll take responsibility for safety assurance at first supply. I'll also take responsibility over the life of the vehicle. So it's a self-selecting entity. And I guess that way you can capture parties like Waymo. They don't, they don't develop the vehicles, but they develop the technology within the vehicles. So the ADSC, they have to meet a number of outcomes-focused safety criteria. Now, these are very closely based on the criteria that were developed by NHTSA in the U.S., um, the highways agency. Um, those criteria relate to, it's a voluntary framework here, there. This would be a, a mandatory framework that these ADSCs have to comply with. So that includes things like testing for the Australian road environment, kangaroos, for example, um, you know, stating what the operational design domain is, you know, having the correct testing and validation processes, et cetera. Um, the ADSC also has to meet um, a few corporate obligations. So this isn't something that manufacturers currently have to do, but because these entities are taking responsibility for the vehicle over its life, this provides a kind of guarantee that they'll still be in the market and can be, can be held liable when things go wrong. So this is around things like having a corporate presence in Australia, having minimal, minimum financial requirements, et cetera. Um, another interesting component of that first supply framework is that there are multiple ways to get into the framework. So the ADS could be within a new vehicle, like currently you just import a new vehicle into the market, but there could also be uh, automated driving systems that are switched on in service. So they haven't been approved at first supply, but they've kind of been dormant and then switched on in service. There's a route for those to also get into the market. And then also aftermarket fitments. So you just have a vehicle, uh, you know, a normal vehicle that a, uh, a separate aftermarket fitment is um, incorporated into while the vehicle's on the road. They also have a route into this, into this supply um, market. In terms of in-service safety, there are, that, that framework's also been uh, agreed in various stages in 2020 and most recently in February of this year. Um, there will be a new national law, which is a really big deal. Um, it'll be a Commonwealth law. So here you can see that we've moved from a state and territory um, approach for on-road safety to a national approach, which is you know, really significant. Um, in terms of control, so where before um, liability always lies with the human, under the new frameworks, an ADS is in control when it's engaged. So in a level three, four, five vehicle, if the ADS is turned on and it's operating, then the human driver won't be liable when something goes wrong. 
there will be new duties in that new law uh, on the ADSC. So there'll be a general safety duty, which is much like a duty of care in work health and safety laws. There'll be some prescriptive duties around reporting and safety management. There'll be requirements around um, making sure that modifications are safe. Um, and there's also requirements around how an entity leaves the markets so to say they go bust. Um, then there needs to be some safeguards around that. Actually, yeah, there was a question at QA. It's what happens if an ADSC goes out of business during the lifetime of the vehicle they're managing? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly that. So there'll be a framework around um, uh, exiting the market. So essentially, where an ADSC uh, envisages that it's going to be, you know, it's going to go bankrupt or something like that. There is a requirement that it, you know, notifies the regul. That there'll be a new national regulator. I didn't mention, so it needs to notify the the national regulator that that's going to happen. Um, it needs to, um, so it, it needs to support the automated driving system for as long as it's in the market. If it exits the market, there's a process for a new ADSE to take over that automated driving system. So if the original ADSE leaves the market before a new ADSE has assumed control, the automated driving system has to be switched off because essentially it would be operating unsupported at that point. So if they can't find a new ADSE, that's kind of the end of that. If they can, then that, that new ADSE meets safety requirements, corporate obligations, and then they assume control of the ADS and then it can keep operating. All right. And yes, as I briefly said, there will be a new national regulator. It's a Commonwealth regulator uh, for in-service safety for automated vehicles. So all of that stuff in that top, uh, top set of bullets there, that's the, the new national law essentially, which will focus on automated driving systems. Human users of automated vehicles. So these are the fallback ready users, those users in level three vehicles that need to take back control. Um, level four users uh, who are in a highly automated vehicle those obligations will sit in state and territory laws. Um, and so those are currently being developed uh, and also some powers around on-road enforcement. So how police interact with automated vehicles, those are also under development. And those will also sit under state and territory frameworks. So this work has been going on for about five years. The new national law is currently being um, drafted or drafting instructions are being prepared. The, um, the safety criteria are being uh, put into a draft Australian design rule, which is being consulted on. So that's all ongoing. The whole regulatory framework is meant to be in place in 2026. That is a time frame that's been pushed out over the years. I think when the NTC first started the AV program, a whole regulatory framework was supposed to be in place by 2020. That quickly became unfeasible. Um, it's just such a complex env environment. So. 2026 is the current goal, but it's very challenging. You know, there's Commonwealth laws that need to be amended and made. There's state and territory laws that need to be drafted and amended and made. And so it's a, it's a very long process. And obviously, you know, AVs aren't necessarily every government's top priority when they've got, you know, COVID and economy and all of those things to, to deal with. So what are the challenge then in terms of the regulation? So I think, you know, what I just said around timeframes for agreeing uh, and implementing nationally consistent laws, those are always going to be very complex and, and, and uh, challenging. We've also got this, you know, this issue where we're trying to create regulation for technology and business models that, you know, they're not here yet. So it's a really uncertain environment to be creating regulation in. And that's always a, a real challenge. And there's a, a bit of a concern about getting out in front and sort of regulating for something that, that might not eventuate. We also need to be mindful of creating an Australian specific uh, regulatory framework ahead of internationally agreed standards. You know, we are technology takers, so we don't want to sort of create any additional barriers to the technology companies bringing their, their uh, technology here. We've also got to think about other relevant regulations. So it's not just about safety and legal operation. Um, there's other things that are um, relevant too, like for, I've put the example there of heavy vehicle fatigue obligations. So for example, you know, if a driver doesn't need to be taking control of the driving task, doesn't need to be monitoring the environment or anything like that, 
then do they need to comply with all of their existing fatigue obligations as a heavy vehicle driver or are those relaxed likely? So all of those things need to be considered. Um, there's also a risk that you undo some of that good work to create a nationally consistent framework by um, having those, those other elements still uh, regulated by states and territories around the human users. So you just need to be mindful um, that that doesn't undo that national consistency. And then there's also the challenge of, you know, what's the capability of those within government and the regulators to actually, you know, assess this technology that's not necessarily their um, bread and butter at the moment. They're dealing with the physical vehicle and components and, you know, the capacity around uh, the software basically is, is very different. So we need to think about that. So these are all the challenges that maybe make you think, we're not quite there yet in terms of having the regulation ready for, for automated vehicles. So that is regulation. And I'll move on now to insurance. So what happens when an automated vehicle causes a crash? It's a very interesting dilemma. Um, so essentially what happens when when the AV causes a crash and the ADS was in control, well, I think it would be fair, I guess, that impacted individuals do have access to compensation. Um, but under current schemes, it's not clear that people injured in an automated driving crash um, do have the same uh, or any access to compensation under existing motor accident injury insurance schemes. Um, so, Reasons for that are around the definitions in motor accident injury insurance laws. Um, they don't contemplate an automated driving system being in control or a, a, you know, it has to be, a, I guess, a human driver. Um, some motor accident injury insurance laws also require someone to be at fault. Um, and that person is a person rather than a, a system. And also motor accident injury insurance schemes are generally designed to cover injuries caused by human error rather than product faults. So there are a number of reasons why currently insurance schemes might not cover um, injury caused by automated vehicles. So we need to have a look at those schemes. Um, and ultimately automated vehicles, you know, they're probably not going to be deployed until insurance is resolved. And in fact, it's a, one of those first supply corporate obligations that the ADSC does hold appropriate insurance. So ISHIM, uh, sorry, the Infrastructure and Transport Ministers meeting have agreed an approach for motor accident injury insurance. So they've agreed, um, essentially there's an overarching principle that no person is better or worse off financially or procedurally in the relevant jurisdiction if they are injured by a vehicle whose ADS was engaged and then if they were injured by a vehicle controlled by a human driver, which is very wordy. Essentially, it just means that people injured by an AV should have access to compensation just as people injured by a normal vehicle. That was agreed by infrastructure and transport ministers in 2019. That was then transferred to treasury ministers because they're responsible for insurance schemes and it's been sitting there for a while. Um, I think they've probably had other things to think about, but obviously it's something that also needs to be in place by 2026 when that whole regulatory framework comes into being as well. So that's motor accident injury insurance schemes and access to compensation. Another thing to think about is the insurers themselves and what some of the considerations they are thinking about at the moment. Um, so they're probably thinking about how do we price risk um, and that might be why we see a lot of insurers getting involved in automated vehicle trials. Um, they're probably also thinking about how they get the data from the automated driving system, how does that data get shared with them so that they can assess liability. So there'll need to be requirements around data sharing and making sure that that's done efficiently uh, when there's been a crash. And I guess they're also thinking about how the insurance market might change over time. Um, so you might see less of a focus on personal insurance schemes uh, for vehicle owners um, as liability shifts to ADSEs uh, increasingly, and especially as automation uh, increases and the vehicles become more kind of fully autonomous. So you potentially also have a smaller insurance market as well. 
and that it's more sort of commercial rather than personal products. And I think that was all I wanted to say about insurance. It's just another piece of the puzzle that needs to be in place uh, for, for automated vehicle deployment. So what are some broader public policy challenges? What are some of the supporting policy settings that are needed to support um, good policy outcomes more generally? I think you know, these don't necessarily need to be resolved before we see commercially deployed vehicles, but they are things that are going to become increasingly important. So what are the necessary policy supports to gain the expected benefits of automated vehicles that we've talked about before? So we've talked about safety, but there are other assumed benefits that might not be automatic or that might not eventuate without other policy interventions. So for example, we talked about congestion, um, you know, we hope that they will reduce co congestion with more efficient trip planning, um, but they could also add to traffic, as I said, if you have empty vehicles running around. Um, so we need to think about what are the supporting settings to, to make sure that you are getting those reductions in congestion. Accessibility benefits, those are often a big one touted um, about automated vehicles, um, but vehicles will actually need to be designed to accommodate um, people with accessibility needs. And we haven't been seeing that in early AV trials, although that is changing. Um, also road traffic laws would need to be actually amended to allow people with some accessibility issues to operate a vehicle on their own. So for example, at the moment, someone with a visual impairment couldn't get a, a, a license to be in a vehicle, uh, to operate a vehicle. But you know, if there's an automated vehicle that, that can take them and they don't need to, you know, do anything that only to drive then potentially they should also be allowed in these vehicles on their own and you know sort of sitting in the driver's seat and laws would need to change to allow that and I guess beyond that when you take away the driver you're taking away the kind of chaperone that can you know provide the assistance that people with um, disabilities might sometimes need you're taking away the pe person that can help them in and out of the vehicle so we need to think about some of those whole of journey issues when you're talking about the accessibility benefits of automated vehicles as well um there's a few things there where i've put down um under cross-cutting policy challenges is a few things related to jobs, to the future of jobs. Um, so driving jobs, you know, potentially you're going to see these decrease. So, you know, the drivers of taxis and Ubers and bus drivers, maybe those jobs will, will decrease over time. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, we could see also a diminishing of the independent repairer profession. So um, I guess, you know, this is very complex technology. You might see uh, the vehicle manufacturers wanting to keep that um, expertise in-house and make sure that they're the ones fixing the vehicles because, you know, it's software and it's complex. Um, so then what does that mean for the independent mechanic? Um, another one I mentioned before, what's the capacity of you know, transport agencies, the governments to, you know, ensure that they're testing these vehicles are properly, properly for, you know, roadworthiness inspections, that they're assessing them properly at first supply and in service as well. They might not have that capability at the moment, and that will need to sort of uplift over time. And the last one I've put there is data exchange. This is hugely complex. Um, you know, AVs are going to produce a, a lot of really valuable data, which could have broader public benefits. Um, so, you know, they could be helpful in things like network optimization, uh, planning decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we ensure that data, well, not how do we ensure, but should data be shared between uh, the companies and, and governments? And how is, should that be done fairly? How should that be done in a way that protects privacy? You know, should it be a commercial exchange or, or not? These are all really uh, complex issues that need to be agreed by the relevant parties. So I'll move on now to trials. So how are, how advanced are trials in automated uh, trials of automated vehicles in Australia? Um, I'm I'm talking about trials here because they play a really important 
part before deployment, I think. Um, they expose the technology to the public uh, and make the public more familiar and hopefully more comfortable with the technology. They allow testing for the unique Australian road environment. Um, they can show us what business models might be viable and they can show what changes might be needed to the infrastructure. So I think they have a really important part to play here before deployment. All right, so what's the current status of trials? So I think I, I mentioned some of this before, there's been over 30 automated vehicle trials in Australia in every state and territory. They have been, I would say of limited um, complexity. They've been, uh, the majority have been low speed shuttle trials on very set routes. Um, and I think that's been because the risk appetite has been quite low for, for automated vehicle trials. Um, mainly from the governments, I'd say from the trialing partners as well, you know, the safety of other road users, that's, that's been paramount. Human chaperones have been used, as far as I, I'm aware, in all of the automated vehicle trials. Um, happy to be told I'm wrong, but at least in the majority, there's always been a human chaperone, even though that might not have necessarily been a requirement of the technology. Um, one of the things we've found is that there's been risky behavior, behaviors around automated vehicles sometimes. So people doing things like jumping out in front of the vehicle or you know, speeding up and dangerously overtaking because it, it's slow, that kind of thing. So that, that shows a bit of, um, it shows some of the attitude of the public to these, these vehicles maybe. There's been limited consideration of accessibility issues, I'd say. Um, and there's been surveys of public acceptance of the technology done through these trials. Um, we've found that a number of people are very accepting of the trial, uh, accepting of the te technology after trial. So they have a good experience, for example, on the shuttle bus, and then they think, oh, okay, the technology is all right. So that's that's been good to see. I guess there's a few things that I'd like to see in trials going forward. Um, I'd really like to see advanced complexity in these trials and advanced risk appetite, um, you know, moving away maybe from the shuttles or operating those shuttles in more complex environments with less sort of traffic management around them. Um, you know, it'd be great to have more complexity as well in integrated mobility trials as well. You know, more trials without human chaperones, more diverse types of environments, more diverse types of vehicles, um, you know, more operational design domains rather than kind of set routes. Um, all of those things would be would be really useful, I think, for actually testing the technology and, and um, I, get, I guess getting a sense for how these vehicles will actually work uh, when they're fully deployed. Um, and I guess, you know, we are seeing that there is more complexity emerging. Um, I saw that there's a uh, tender in New South Transport for New South Wales for a full-sized uh, automated bus trial. Um, I think they also had a, a trial that had a vehicle with no human chaper and actually for, for one part of the, the trial. Um, and then there was a recent announcement, I think it was last week or the week before from Transurban about an automated truck trial, the first in Australia, on, on City Link in Victoria. Um, it'll be great to have more integrated mobility uh, trials. Uh, so like the CHAD and the Ames trials in Victoria and in Queensland. Uh, and it'd be good to have more cross or any cross border trials um, at the moment because of the way the trials framework is set up. These have been limited to individual states and territories, but it would be good to have some co cooperation between governments to you know, to allow for a cross-border trial. Ultimately, when these vehicles are deployed, they're going to be allowed on the whole road network. So I think it would be very useful to, to see how it how, how they work going across borders. More rural trials would be really interesting to see. Um, commercial trials, so like that sort of Waymo, Uber type application would be really useful or, you know, PT, uh, public transport uh, applications as well. And I think, you know, those, those last three points there are really just about the direction that we need to be heading in, I think. Um, so I think we need to be choosing trials that provide an actual transport solution or that incorporate these vehicles into a current transport solution. So we're not just having trials that are kind of like demonstrations and then off they go. 
Um, we also need to think about trialing in a way where we're offering a clear route to deployment. So it's not just, again, it's not just, you know, put your vehicle here in this small domain and then, um, you know, see you later in five years time when the commercial deployment framework is in place. There needs to be some kind of a clear pathway for these companies to keep being incentivized to trial here. And then finally, uh, further government investment in trials. I think it's obviously easier said than done, but I don't think we're going to see a huge amount of, you know, huge increase in trials unless there is that that government investment to support that. So that is all I have on trials. Oh, I've stepped forward. And I'll move on now to the infrastructure. So do we have the infrastructures to support automated vehicles? Um, I think this is a really interesting one because one of the things I've been learning in my current role at the Centre for Connection and Automated Transport is I've been going around talking to a lot of, a lot of people in, in this um, stakeholder community and I've been hearing that, you know, there's a really diverse range of views around what the infrastructure is that's needed for automated vehicles. There's people that say that there are only really minimal changes needed to support these vehicles because the technology will adapt to what we have now. Others say there are you know, huge opportunities that you could be opening up by making more significant changes to the infrastructure. So I guess there's a, it's, you know, a range of ways that you can think about infrastructure. And I think you know, splitting it up into that sort of requirements and necessity side and the, you know, the opportunity side is a, is a useful way to look at it. So I've got some very dense slides now. I don't feel the need to um, read it all, but I just wanted to make sure that I had all my sources right. Um, so I've put requirements uh, question mark down there because I think you know I've split up the slide and the next slide into what are the requirements for AVs and what are the you know the broader opportunities. Um, but I think you could shift some of these things between the slides. So. They, they do have that question mark there. Um, so some of the things that have come up in, in studies about the infrastructure that's required. So Ostroads have talked about um, physical infrastructure standards. Um, and they've talked about um, physical infrastructure um, in a phased approach. So uh, in a phased approach, I guess, meaning that the technology will come uh, with increasing automation over time. So in the short term, um, they would be supporting changes to do with level three vehicles, so the lower end of automation, um, which would also benefit uh, drivers of conventional vehicle. So these are things like improving the visibility of road lines and signs, um, harmonizing signage, that kind of thing. Um, Austroids have also talked about the availability of HD mapping as being important uh, and of continuous data connectivity. Um, in Queensland, as part of the CHAD pilot, um, they had some learnings around signage consolidation as well, um, improving the understandability of one-off signs. So sometimes you get these really random signs that you don't see anywhere else. And how does an automated vehicle um, identify what exactly they mean? And also there was, um, there was um, a finding around the importance of being able to flag changes to the um, automated driving system. So say, for example, there were roadworks ahead um, there should be a way for road managers to com communicate with the automated driving system entities to say, hey, the road's changed, and then in that way sort of um, make it a bit easier for the automated driving system. And Infrastructure Australia has talked about uh, nationally uniform standards for the design and operation of road and digital assets. So some of the broader opportunities, again, looking at Ostros and some of the things that they talked about being useful in the medium to long term, um, safe stopping zones on motorways. Um, so this is so automated vehicles, when they need to come to a minimal risk condition, they can sort of veer off to the side of the motorway. Um, and then things like remote parking facilities and mobility hubs. Some of the other things um, that could provide opportunities are, you know, C CITS road infrastructure that the vehicles can communicate with, um, automated freight corridors are, are something that, you know, they're an interesting idea being looked at in other countries. Um, dedicated automated vehicle lanes, I'm not sure um, about 
whether that's potentially a good idea or not, not a good idea, but it's out there as something that we could consider. And I guess the other really important one is electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Automated vehicles will likely be electric vehicles. So it's very tied up in that. And so we can't forget the, the need for that supporting infrastructure as well. So in terms of the challenges around infrastructure, again, similar to regulation, um, you know, picking winners. So getting in front of the technology, that's always a little bit difficult. You know, we're trying, we're putting money towards uh, infrastructure um, that we're, for technology that we're hoping will emerge in scenarios that we hope we're hoping will be um, here. Um, so that's always a little bit tricky. You know, obviously infrastructure projects are hugely costly. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a low appetite from both governments and trialers uh, in the context of trials for supporting additional infrastructure. Um, but that obviously will need to change when it comes to deployment. Um, national consistency, so around harmonized standards, anything that involves national consistency, when you're talking about um, state and territory frameworks, that's going to be tricky. Um, and then obviously also those other government policy objectives and interdependencies like electric vehicles. So, you know, what flavor of government might have an effect on, you know, what what the what's the sort of investment into this kind of infrastructure is. Oop. Got a preview there. All right, so we're getting towards the end. So public acceptance, I won't spend too much time on this because I understand that Mike Regan spoke about this a bit in his presentation in the first of these series. Um, it's important to look at public acceptance, I think, because ultimately, if the public don't embrace this technology, you just won't get the take up. And for those of us that consider that AVs do have all of these potential benefits, slow consumer uptake will mean that we don't gain those benefits as soon as we could. So the, the I guess the future uptake of automated vehicles will involve bringing the public along for the journey. So the National Transport Commission did a um, lessons learned report from trials. Um, the, the stuff I mentioned about pre uh, post trial surveys where people were very happy that came from that report. Um, uh, that report also noted that um, where the trials offered a natural transport solution. So for example, it offered a route to service a community that hadn't been serviced by public transport before, it was also more likely to gain acceptance there. Um, I guess, you know, so in the trial setting, you've seen some positive experiences, but overall the research shows, shows that public sentiment towards automated vehicles is a bit negative. Um, the ADV public opinion surveys are a good source and Mike Regan was involved in those. Um, they showed over time that people were becoming increasingly aware of automated vehicles. Um, some of the things that they showed were that not many people had experienced the tech for themselves. People said that they were comfortable with the idea of cars controlling most driving functions, but they, there were a lot of concerns about the issues relating to fully autonomous vehicles. So riding in a car with no driver, the car moving by itself between locations, um, allowing a child to be in the vehicle on its own, vehicle security, et cetera. Uh, one of the scenarios that they found people were least like, uh, least comfortable with was cars changing lanes by themselves and following cars ahead too closely. Um, less than half of respondents thought that AVs could be safer than cars driven by humans, which is a very interesting finding. Um, most have most uh, said that they would like to drive an AV manually sometimes. Um, so potentially, you know, that uh, level three, level four, a kind of vehicle rather than a dedicated automated vehicle. Um, many people were concerned about data privacy, which is probably unsurprising. And most weren't willing to pay more for an AV than they would for a conventional vehicle. That probably has some implications for you know how quick we think that uptake is going to be uh, very early in the very early days because this techn technology is likely to be expensive um, early on.
So I'll just end with some some other practical challenges, which are really just a bit of a, a brain dump. Um, and you can probably think of a, a lot more issues that we're, we also need to deal with. Um, so the first few relate to Australia just being an attractive place to trial or deploy as, you know, a first set, a first kind of country in the mix. Um, Left-hand drive doesn't help us. Um, you know, a lot of the technology is being developed elsewhere in the world that, you know, in, in right-hand drive countries. So that has to be adapted to come here. Um, we're a very small market. We're only 1.5% of the vehicle market. Um, so that also doesn't make us necessarily that attractive. And then when you have a federation, obviously we're splitting that market up even more. That's not to say that there aren't many benefits to trialing, into, trialing in Australia, but I guess these, these are the challenges that we need to be mindful of. There are some other things that we also need to think about, like, um, you know, we're preparing when the technology, and I've said this a few times, technology, the business models, the applications are uncertain. So there's the potential that we make changes now for scenarios that we might not see or don't eventuate. And I guess we also don't necessarily want to get out in front of other countries. You know, international alignment is also really important, um, while at the same time acknowledging that international harmonization won't come for some time. So there's a need to sort of have something in place at least. Capability and capacity of all the parties that are going to interrupt, uh, interact with automated vehicles. So not only the governments, but um, also you know, repairers, testers, operators, et cetera. Uh, processes will need to change. I'm talking about all kinds of processes. I've got government processes down as an example. Um, for example, uh, registration databases, they'll need to collect attributes of automated vehicles instead of just, um, you know, registered owners. Um, traffic infringement systems will need to change. Who do you send the, the traffic fine off to in the post? Um, and then finally, I've put down their driver education. So how do we license human drivers now? Um, does this need to change to account for increasing automation? So in summary, how ready are we for automated vehicle deployment in Australia? Well, as we've learned today, beyond the technology, there are many elements that must be ready to enable automated vehicle deployment in Australia, or that will contribute to their uh, fast deployment. And based on a look at some of those challenges still remaining, I guess it appears that we're not quite ready, um, but things are happening. We're just not quite there yet. Um, the point I've made on the slide is that it might not actually matter that we're not quite ready because when the technology is ready for deployment, it may just find its way onto our roads somehow. And I'm thinking, you know, I guess the Uber kind of scenario where no one was ready, they came, they disrupted regulatory frameworks, they disrupted industries and, you know, you saw what happened. So I guess it's really important that we keep momentum in this space. If we want to ensure that we have an operating environment that's safe, uh, efficient and suitable for Australia, we really need to maintain that momentum to get all of these re elements ready and try to get in front of the technology. So that is essentially it for today. Um, I would like to thank you all very much for, for having me here. Um, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you about automated vehicles. Um, I'll give a little plug as well for the Centre for Connection and Automated Transport. We are a new centre. Uh, we were established this year by the Australian Road Research Board. Um, I came on board a few months ago and we're really looking to be a collaboration of government industry, um, community and academic institutions. Um, so please do to reach out to learn a bit more about CCAT. Um, our focus is on being the public champion for connection and automated transport, not just in road transport, but also across transport modes. And we're going to have a particular focus on, on the infrastructure preparedness for connected and automated transport as well. So that's secret. But anyway, thank you so much for having me here today. And um, I wish you all the best with your studies. And I'd love to hear a bit more from all of you as well. Right. Right. Some online questions here. Yeah, sure. Um, we're only one microphone. If you can Oh, 
Um, yeah, the first one, how do you expect automated vehicles to perform in uneven and uncertain terrains? For example, recent rain created a lot of potholes that has damaged cars in Australian roads. It might be harder to control several different parameters at the same time. So this is more of a technical well, question. Yeah, so yeah. I can't give you a technical answer, but I guess what I will say is that in terms of a regulatory answer, um, you know, it would be a requirement of those safety assurance processes that the automated driving system entity that it can show that its automated driving system can operate safely in all different kinds of environments. And I guess, you know, potholes and that kind of thing, you'd foresee that that should be something that they could show that the ADS can uh, can manage. So there should be that regulatory um, certification at, at the first supply of these vehicles. The second one, just adopt US or EU infrastructure standards. Our market is too small for the manufacturers to adopt to adapt to our infrastructure. Hook turns in Melbourne come to mind. Yeah. Hook turns and kangaroos always come to come to the forefront of these discussions. Um, yeah, I mean it's a valid point. You know, international harmonization is really important. Um, so certainly anything we do here needs to we need to be doing things informed by what's happening overseas. We need to be looking outwards. And you know, in some instances it doesn't make sense to sort of go ahead with, with something unique in the Australian environment. And what? Well, and the land crab sign on Christmas Island? <laughs> I think this might, might be to do with the one-off uh, road signs that are a bit confusing. Uh, what about this? What would be the cost difference between conventional and automated vehicles? What is expected penetration rate of automated vehicles? Is it possible to keep dedicated lanes? This you already mentioned something if the penetration rate is smaller look all great questions i don't think i can ask i don't think i can answer what the cost difference will be i just assume that there will be a cost difference i guess if you look at you know when electric vehicles were st starting to come into the market they were they were highly more highly priced than than normal vehicles um what's the expected penetration rate and i guess uh, as well the dedicated lanes question i guess i would um I can't answer that right now, but I'd refer you to research done by Austroads where they have looked at, you know, forecasts out to 2030. Uh, and I think that was updated for 2031 about automated vehicle penetration in the Australian market. So I think have a look there. Uh, I'm interested, how does Australia's regulatory development of autonomous vehicles compare to other countries? Are there any particular countries regulatory frameworks we are following more than others? It's actually an interesting one because we uh, we kind of have got ahead a little bit. So the in terms of the policy development and you know the idea of an automated driving system entity, a lot of countries have been actually looking to us. Um, you know we were doing that work in 2017, 18, 19 to develop those concepts, and we saw that sort of automated driving system entity concept get picked up in the UK, for example. Um, you know, they've now, the UK has gone ahead and sort of had all of that agreed and they're now drafting a law which will have the automated driving system entity. So I think we started out ahead, but we've got a long way to go in terms of, you know, the federation and having all of these laws implemented at the different levels of government. Um, I think in terms of um, the way the Australian framework is designed to, is set up, um, the, those first supply requirements around the safety of the automated driving system, it's intended that they will um, over time get subsumed by the UNECE standards. So as UNECE standards are made, for example, around you know, minimal risk maneuvers, then the minimal risk maneuver part of the Australian design rules that we already had will sort of come out and get replaced by that. So there'll be increasing alignment over time. Good. Maybe there are more questions from the people. Yeah, any room. questions here? In that case, would you mind if I take oh, the yes. microphone? Oh. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, so I just have a question uh, regarding the I mean, people who are driving some normal cars 
And now in the current situation, we know that there are more than these uh, autonomous cars, I mean, autonomous vehicles. So um, let me refer back to my background. I was, uh, I, I've done my uh, master's thesis in uh, intelligent transportation system. And I remember on that time, it was important if a, if the traffic lights could show the timing of the traffic light to the drivers or or not. So that has some uh, impact on the drivers. So if the drivers uh, driving normal cars, is do you think that it might have some impact on them if they know that the car that they're approaching or overriding like is like an, an autonomous vehicle or do you think that it's not something which is important? Um, so are, are you talking about, I guess, the, you know, what the reaction of human drivers would be if they knew that they were approaching a, an automated vehicle, for example? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting debate. There's, um, there's some that think that automated vehicles should have um, light signals or audio signals so that they're um, obviously uh, shown to be an automated vehicle. I think that scene is very useful for enforcement, for example, to know, you know, if an automated system is, is in operation or um, it's liable at the time of a crash you know instantly they can they can see I think there's been mixed views in the research um, about whether that's actually um, safe um, so for example you could see um, from one of my slides I mentioned that there was risky behavior around automated vehicles so you know potentially it could have the impact of changing road user behavior um, and it could be for the worse um, people might act in unpredictable ways around an automated vehicle just because they're a little bit unsure what to do. Um, it's been discussed at the UNECE level as well, uh, autom audible and audible invisible light signals, signals rather. And it's um, currently like I think it's the focus of um, a paper that's been developed, I think, by Germany, and it's been going through various iterations. At the moment, there isn't really a conclusive answer to that. So they, they're they just not creating rules around that at the moment. So yeah, there's an interesting debate about whether it actually will lead to safer outcomes or not. That's <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, just elaborating a little bit on over this issue. Um, I was wondering if there is any research group in your research center or in Australia investigating um, human vehicle interaction in terms that um, or interactions inside of the car shape or behavior, right? Like uh, we are not in the driver, or we are not, you know, blinding, fall, blinding his eyes, or you know, the, all the setup shape or interaction. And I think in autonomous vehicles that will change and shape or behavior as humans inside of them. Anyone is investigating this? Well, that's one thing, but I was also thinking like, uh, now we need a driver's license that certifies that we are at the minimal level of skill to be in the road and share roads with everybody else, right? Um, but eventually, which is also an industry, right? It's a big, big industry all around the world. Um, so um, I can imagine, uh, I cannot imagine that we will get we will get rid of driver's license just like that, right? Like a certain training should be done or certain, no, not sure if somebody's investigating about this. Yeah, it's a good question. There are, um, so there's, uh, international licensing organizations, like, I'm not exactly sure the names, but that are looking at the, that I think that continually, continually look at licensing requirements. And they've been looking at, you know, ADAS technologies and, you know, their increasing use and what the, you know, requirements around licensing uh, need to be in, in Europe, for example, to accommodate that increasing um, automation. And I think we'll just see more of that happening around automated driving systems. Um, you know, I don't think driver education should stop, you know, there's always, well, not there's always, but the drivers will have a role in um, vehicles on the road for a long, long time. It's just a matter of whether that licensing um, education needs to change a little bit just to incorporate these new technologies, you know, they, they might need new skills around 
request to intervene, for example, that's not something they'll have come up with um, now. They, they're always in control, but in a level three vehicle, for example, or in a level four, they can give control to the ADS, but then they need to take back control in some situations. So those kinds of skills around, you know, being receptive and knowing how long to, to wait or to, you know, how to take back control safely, those are kinds of things that could maybe come into driver education. And, and I'm not sure actually I'm not sure it's an interesting one um, so in terms of licensing there are definitely bodies looking at that in terms of interactions within the car I would assume so but I'm, I'm not sure of them yeah, yeah exactly there you go <laughs> Well, um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, talking about equipment, uh, I just want to know uh, what um, we are in the stage of modeling. I mean, uh, we need to implement uh, AV in the real world. So uh, before that, I want to know, uh, do we have um, enough progress in, for example, machine vision and other fields that relate to AV in the software? I think I'm probably not a great person to ask about that, I have to say. Um, I mean, definitely, I think, you know, part of the series has been in particular to focus on what are the technology barriers out there at the moment. And there is the question, you know, is the technology ready now? Is that all of that kind of background stuff sufficient at the moment or is there more that needs to be done to ensure that there's this technology is safe and reliable so it's not my it's not my expertise but I'm sure you'll hear more about it in this lecture series I don't know if Max you have anything to say about that <laughs> okay later the experts will will fill you in thank you I Hello. I just to my observation is that it seems that airports are the like place say welcome to the uh, autonomous driver. I'm just curious in the airports in Australia said we are willing to uh, do this transformation. We'll have more motor vehicles like tractors for luggage. Do you have any other that's information? <laughs> This is the perfect opportunity for another CCAT plug. Um, I think, you know, driverless vehicles are obviously the, the hot topic and the kind of exciting project that everyone wants to talk about, but automation is being used and has been used in airplanes for a long, long time. They're being increasingly used in defense. Um, um, it's being used in agriculture. Um, it's being used in trains. So, you know, this connected and automated technology is really converging in a number of different transport modes and logistics and all of that. So, uh, you know, it's it's totally, you're totally spot on. You know, there's lessons that we can be learning from a, a number of different um, transport modes to, you know, to inform uh, automated vehicle deployment on roads. Um, where I'm working, it, there's been a recognition of that. And, you know, there was a previous organization called ADVI, which was just fo focused on driverless vehicles. CCAT's the next iteration of that. And it's broadened out its scope to connected and automated transport and not just road transport, but all of those other modes, because there is that recognition that there is this convergence. And if we want to prepare for the technology, you might need to think about things a little bit more holistically. So, yeah, certainly spot on. First of all, I really would like to thank you for this very comprehensive, informative uh, presentation. And you really have a very huge knowledge, which is, I find, very humbling uh, regarding especially all the regulatory aspects and so on, of which I must admit I, I, I was really ignorant. So I've learned a lot today. Uh, still, there are certain things that I'm really curious about because I... I, I read the newspapers and every day I find the news that are very, very conflicting. 
such that like, for example, I hear that in Singapore or in Dubai or now recently in Canada, they're going to introduce this or that um, experimental or, or non-experimental kind of service with the taxis or self. But uh, then I, um, at the same time, I hear like a few weeks ago, the main manufacturers, Volvo, Ford, they announced that they were going to divest from the development of level four and five because they thought at least for the immediate future is a huge waste of money. Uh, at the same time, I hear that Tesla is doing some tests, like there are cars around in the world running millions of kilometers without, I mean, we are not even aware of them, but, but they are around us. And they're not always very successful because there are accidents happening. So I, I wonder how all these things can happen at the same time in the same uh, universe. And, and uh, especially, okay, one question is, what does it take to do research on autonomous vehicles today on the road? Who gives permission to do that? And what are the kind of assurances that you need to give uh, a government or a federal state or uh, whatever authority that your car uh, has the minimum requirement to, you know, to be tested on the road, no? Uh, and second thing is how, uh, how much should I believe all the things that I hear about projects that are imminent just to be, to be started tomorrow. So tomorrow there is a taxi somewhere in some city in the world that is going to, to drive me with level five uh, autonomy. I'm very confused. I, I don't know what is true and what is false. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just the nature of working or being involved in a space where, um, you know, the technology is new and it's all still under development. The business models aren't yet proved and we don't know what's viable or not. So everyone's kind of, you know, all the technology companies are developing the technology that they want to develop and trying to, you know, trial it and test it in ways that they want to test it. There's no kind of unifying theme, I guess, at the moment. So, yeah, you see a, a public transport application of a shuttle bus in Germany. You see a Waymo robo taxi fleet in the, the US. You see Teslas running around with, you know, private individuals in control. There's all these different kinds of business models. And I think trialing is it is very important to see what's actually viable. And I guess some of those points I was making around those trial challenges, you know, we need to be really careful about the trials that we're choosing and being sort of realistic about what we think will can or should progress to a, to a transport solution and what a path to deployment is. I guess the first part of your question around what are the actual requirements for trials? So I guess I can speak to Australia. So, and this is under current frameworks, so the trial frameworks. So, Currently, a if a trialer, uh, I guess a tech company and a, you know, say there might be a council involved and a, a university involved, they want to get together and form a cons consortium to, to trial a, an automated vehicle. Um, they need to get a letter of support from the the state and territory agency that they want to, the state that they want to trial in. They need to um, meet the first supply requirements. So. Um, Australian design rules. Um, so those include, um, you know, the, the specs of the, the vehicle itself, but I, essentially there'll be a number of, I guess, um, you know, traditional vehicle specs that don't apply. So you need to have, you know, an application done by someone that probably has experience in vehicle certification and can sort of navigate that process, that Commonwealth government process. Then you have to come back to the state and territory government and they then uh, sort of assess things like a traffic management plan, a safety management plan. Uh, you have to get your the operator on board. All these kinds of requirements have to stay, happen at the state and territory level. There's requirements around you know reporting of incidents, that kind of thing as well, and you know um, uh, end of trial evaluation, that kind of thing. That's all set out in the I guess each state and territory's you know, information. I suppose um, it's nearly nationally. Consistent, I suppose. You know, there are a number of similar requirements across state and territories, but they are a bit different. But you know, things like a traffic management plan, a risk management um, approach, a safety management plan, those are all the things that you'll need to to get a trial going on the on public roads, at least in Australia. And, and so, and the following question: Let's say, uh, what are the countries or 
the experiences that are more advanced in the world? Where should we look for uh, if we want to find those trials that have been done already more successfully and they're ready for the implementation? Yeah, so, so Waymo is always um, discussed as the, the company that's done the most kilometers and they've been operating for a, a number of years. They're um, operating in the US, which is a little complex because it's all, you know, regulated state by state. So they're trialing in, I think, Arizona, um, you know, Phoenix, San Francisco, like various states. But in those states that they are trialing in, they've got, you know, commercial fleets going. So it's, it's quite well advanced. I think GM's doing a similar thing. So those robo-taxi models are, seem to be going well. And I think there's a number of people that think those will be the, the first to deploy. I think in Australia, there's probably a really good case for automated trucking. You know, we've got such long distances. So that's probably a, a good business model that we we might see here. But again, it's, you know, we're just operating in a different, in, in an environment of uncertainty. I don't think there's any one answer or any one winner that we can pick now. Now because it's such early days, I suppose we see some. So the the approach um, to regulation that we've got developing in Australia aims to accommodate all levels of automation, so level three to five vehicles, in any kind of vehicle. So it could be a light, a heavy, heavy vehicle, whatever. Some countries have gone the route of um, picking types, so or sort of going in stages. So in um, Japan, for example, they allow level three automation. Um, in certain domains in Germany, they've regulated to allow, and this is like laws that have already come into effect. Um, in Germany, they allow level four on highways, um, but there needs to be a remote operator. So there's there's various um, there's various sort of approaches that people are taking. I think what you're seeing is that everyone is um, focusing on their own goals. And that sort of unifying international harmonization just isn't there yet. Um, so I think you'll probably see a bit more of this for some time. Who will be liable for road accidents? The car company, the driver, or anybody else? People are even recommended to report small accident to police. So what would be the procedure in case of accidents with autonomous vehicles? Yeah. Um, so in terms of accidents in an automated vehicle, um, I guess those control rules would apply. So if the automated driving system was in control um, in the, you know, in the lead up to a crash, then it's the automated driving system entity that would be held liable. So that's the entity that had um, self-selected at first supply to be responsible for that vehicle over its entire life. Um, if it was the human that was in control in an automated vehicle at the time of the crash, then it's the human that's that's liable. Um, in terms of reporting, yep. Um, so there will be uh, in-service requirements in that new national law for the automated driving system entity to report any safety incidents to that new national regulator. Um, so any incidents, um, it, it must keep a log of all incidents and it must report um, significant safety incidents to the national regulator. And the national regulator can then choose to sort of investigate if it thinks there might have been a breach of, of one of its, uh, you know, general safety duties or prescriptive duties under the new national law. I think we had a very interesting discussion and the presentation was really wonderful. I would like to thank again, uh, Raila David and uh, do all the best wishes for this uh, new uh, center for connected and uh, automated transportation. Uh, thank you so much for visiting us. And uh, please let's keep in touch and also uh, for the continuation of this uh, seminar. Um, and uh, Raila is going to stay with us uh, now for uh, at least uh, well, for a while. So uh, if you want to stay with us and continue the conversation, uh, please uh, be welcome. Uh, so I would like to say then uh, goodbye to all the people who are attending online and again thank you very much for your attention and for your participation also thanks to my colleague uh, milad for helping organizing this and thank you very much to the uh, unsw ai institute and the ai hub of unsw canberra for supporting this uh, uh, series and for sponsoring it um, so thank you and 
Спасибо.